The T. Isis Ernslaw is a rare survivor from the Edwardian period. The Ernslaw is the last survivor from a small fleet of steamers that once serviced the communities along Lake Wakatipu in the South Island of New Zealand. Completed in 1912, the Ernslaw has been in regular service for over 108 years and is today a tourist vessel operating daily cruises between Queenstown and Walter Peak Station. The story of the Ernstlaw begins in November of 1902, when the New Zealand government purchased the Wakatipu Steam Navigation Company after unreliable services and price gouging forced a government intervention. Services on Lake Wakatipu would be placed under the control of the New Zealand Railways. During the purchase, the railways inherited a trio of steamers, the Antrim, the Ben Ormond, and the Mountaineer. These three steamers were quickly growing inadequate for freight and passenger services, which were vital to the small, isolated communities and country stations along Wake Wakatipu. So calls quickly grew for a new, larger, and more comfortable steamer to meet with increasing demand. In 1907, a pattern from Queenstown residents convinced Prime Minister Sir Jospit Ward to lobby Parliament to finance a new steamer. After much debate, finally in 1909, a new steamer would be announced for Lake Wakatipu. In August of 1910, a public notice was published in the Otago Daily Times calling for tenders to build the new steamer with specifications for a twin screw steamer capable of carrying up to 1,000 passengers at a speed of 15 knots and was to be entirely constructed in New Zealand. Meanwhile, naval architect Hugh McCree from the New Zealand Railways Department was given the task of designing the new steamer. Hugh originally proposed the paddle steamer, but this proposal was rejected. The final design would be of a 168 foot long steamer with a beam of 24 feet, powered by two coal fired triple expansion jet condensing steam engines with a maximum speed of 19 knots. The final design would be three decks high, featuring two saloons, an open bridge and promenade for passengers, and a forward cargo hold capable of carrying up to 40 tons of cargo. The final design would be an enlarged version of the two Dunedin Harbour ferries, Eureka and the Waikana. In September of 1911, Messrs. John McGregor and Co. of Dunedin would win a £20,000 tender to build the new steamer. Construction would begin at McGregor Shipyard in July of 1911. By October of the same year, the Ernslaw's hull was completed. Each part was then numbered before being disassembled for shipment to Kingston by train. The Ernslaw would be formally named after Mount Ernslaw, which is located near Glen Orchie at the head of Lake Wakatipu. The Ernslaw's hull would then be reconstructed on the shoreline at Kingston. However, progress was slow due to a lack of experienced carpenters. Three months later, in February of 1912, the Ernslaw's completed hull would be launched. Though no formal ceremony was held to mark the occasion, a large crowd did travel from Queenstown to witness the launching. The Ernslaw was the largest vessel built in New Zealand at the time. After her launching, the Ernslaw would be moored to the wharf at Kingston to have her engines and interior fittings installed. Seven months later, in August of 1912, the Ernslaw made her first sea trial, sailing to Halfway Bay and back again without an incident. Just over two weeks later, the Ernslaw completed her second sea trial, this time going further to the entrance of Queenstown Bay. The New Zealand government would then approve the commissioning of the Ernslaw, and the New Zealand Railways would then make plans for her maiden voyage. 
On the 18th of October, 1912, the Ernslaw would depart Kingston for her maiden voyage. Over 200 people had journeyed from across the South Island to attend the maiden voyage. At about 5 p.m., after a 90 minute trip, the Ernslaw arrived at Queenstown Bay. This was a momentous occasion for Queenstown residents. A flotilla of smaller, private vessels had come out to accompany the new arrival. A large crowd had gathered on the purpose built wharf, and a local brass band played music for the occasion. The next day, the Ernslaw made her first excursion to Glen Orkey. A public holiday had been declared in Queenstown so as many people as possible could journey on the new arrival. Over 550 people were on board for the 17 mile journey. Glen Orchy locals held great celebrations to mark the occasion. The Ernslaw made her debut with positive reviews from both the public and the press. The Ernslaw would enter into regularly scheduled services two days later on the 21st of October. The Ernslaw had a relatively uneventful career with the New Zealand Railways, with only a few minor incidences. On two separate occasions, the Ernslaw was accidentally grounded on the Shingle shoreline. The most notable incident occurred in December of 1922 during a trial of her new slipway, which was powered using the boiler and engine from the retired paddle steamer Antrim. However, the new slipway was at fault and the winching cable snapped, causing the Ernslaw to slide back into the lake. The leftover momentum caused the Ernslaw to drift uncontrollably, nearly running aground on the rocks at Kurikuri Falls. By the 1960s, the Ernslaw's future would seem uncertain. By this time, roads now connected all of the communities along Lake Okatipu. Both road and bus traffic grew to replace the lake steamers. By 1968, the Ernslaw was consistently running at a deficit and plans were being made to scuttle her, sparking outrage from locals who were dependent on the essential freight services. A Auckland based syndicate of four young entrepreneurs. Who eventually became known as the Boys, showed interest in leasing the Ernslaw and operating her as a for profit service. They eventually struck a deal with the New Zealand government and took over operations in January of 1969 under the banner of the Lake Wakatipu Steamship Company. However, despite the new operators, it wasn't exactly smooth sailing. The essential freight service was not profitable enough to cover operating costs, even with a reduced timetable. After six months of operation, the boys approached the New Zealand government asking for a $16,000 subsidy to cover operating costs. The government eventually agreed to subsidize operating costs after considerable pressure from local interest groups. However, The subsidies w a s only a short relief for the boys. The boys then decided to put a greater emphasis on tourism. However, they consistently failed to attract enough tourists. By October of 1969, the government subsidies were withdrawn after failed negotiations. Less than a month later, operations were ceased after the boys had literally run out of money. So much so that they could no longer afford to pay $108 for a day's worth of coal. The boys' business venture may have been an absolute failure, but their high level of dedication had earned them the respect of locals. The New Zealand Railways would then resume operations for a brief period of time until December of 1969, when Fiordland Travel Limited. Who were looking to expand their tourism operations to the Queenstown area had struck a deal with the New Zealand government to lease the Ernslaw for the tourism market. Unlike the boys, 
Field Land Travel would operate the Ernslaw with a long-term plan in mind. Field Land Travel would dedicate a small tug to providing the essential freight services. This move would drastically reduce costs and would free the Ernslaw to focus on tourism. In 1971, cruises to Kingston to meet with the Kingston Flyer would be suspended in favour of shorter, more profitable cruises. Starting from 1972, Fiordland Travel would focus on lunchtime cruises around Frankton Arm and afternoon cruises to Walter Peak Station. In 1980, cruises to Walter Peak Station would be suspended in favour of cruises to Mount Nicholas Station. In 1982, Fiordland Travel would formally purchase the Ernstlaw from the New Zealand government and in the same year had withdrawn the Ernstlaw for a major refurbishment. Another, smaller refurbishment in 1986 would bring the Ernstlaw to her current condition. In 1991, a deal was made with the property owners of Walter Peak Station, and the Ernslaw began operating there again. The Frankdom Arm cruises would be redrawn the same year. The Walter Peak route would prove highly profitable for Fiordland Travel, who have since been renamed to Real Journeys in 2002. On October the 18th, 2012, the Ernstlaw would journey to Kingston to conduct a reenactment of her maiden voyage, celebrating over 100 years of service. Throughout the century, the Ernstlaw has hosted royalty on four different occasions, including Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip in 1990. In 1978, English composer Ron Goodwin composed a symphony based off the rhythm of the Ernstlaw's engine, titled the Ernstlaw Steam Theme. In 2008, the Ernstlaw made a brief appearance as an Amazon riverboat during a travel montage in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. The original New Zealand Railways Queenstown Shipping Office has also been preserved. Previously located in central Queenstown, the building has since been relocated to Frankton and is now the building for the Boatshed Cafe. In the far end of the cafe, you can find a display case filled with models of the former lake steamers. The mast of the Ben Ormond can be seen at the Queenstown Wharf. There is a small plaque commemorating the ship, which was scuttled near Kingston in 1952, leaving the Ernstlaw as the sole surviving steamer on Lake Wakatipu. Meanwhile, a 14km section of the rail line from Kingston to Fairlight has also been preserved as a heritage railway, known as the Kingston Flyer. Unfortunately, the railway has been sitting in a state of limbo since 2013 due to maintenance and financial issues, with the railway being passed between various different owners. However, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. A new owner has acquired the railway in mid-2019 and work has been underway to bring the flyer back up to steam. The new owners are hoping to have the flyer back up and running by the end of 2020. As a part-time rail enthusiast, I'm happy to see that progress is finally being made to restore the flyer. When previous visits to Kingston to view the slowly decaying railway was quite depressing. So it is an absolute joy to witness actual progress being made. A small team are gradually working on the project, though the years of neglect has had a great toll on the railway's infrastructure and rolling stock, so there is still a lot of progress to be made. So that brings us to the current day. A cruise on the Ernstlaw normally starts from $70 per person, 
and is about a 40 minute cruise between Queenstown Bay and Walter Peak Station. However, unless you paid an additional $30, you were not entitled to disembark at Walter Peak Station. During peak times, the urn slaw would typically be crowded with an entire busload were for foreign tourists. The large crowds and high ticket prices can be a bit off-putting for domestic tourists. However, the current year is 2020, and 2020 has a serious coughing problem. So, with New Zealand's borders closed for the foreseeable future, and with the complete destruction of the international tourism market, most tourism operators in Queenstown have been forced to readapt for the domestic market. Real journeys have done the same with the Earnslaw. The number of cruises per day has been reduced from five to one midday cruise and one evening cruise on Saturdays. As of August, ticket prices have been reduced to $52 per person and that includes a one-hour stop at Walter Peak Station. The Earnslaw operates all year round, but is redrawn for yearly maintenance from June to early July. Now that the history part of the video is out of the way, let me give you a quick tour of the Earnslaw and explain some of the modifications that have been made throughout the years. The tour starts in the small onboard museum, which is located in the forward part of the main deck. Here you will see a small gallery of historical photographs detailing the history of the Earnslaw and of the other lake steamers, including a copy of this marvellous 2012 painting. Walking out of the museum, we walk alongside the starboard side of the promenade. Confusingly, the upper deck is also frequently referred to as the promenade, though typically the open walking space on the second deck of a vessel is typically called the promenade. Continuing along the starboard promenade, we come alongside the first class saloon. The Ernstlaw originally had a class system, but this was abolished during the 1930s. The saloon was remodeled during the 1986 refurbishment, remodeling the saloon to be more in line with the Ernstlaw's heritage status. The dining saloon was once located beneath the first class saloon on the lower deck and could have been accessed via a narrow stairway. The dining saloon has since been converted into a kitchen. At the time of filming, the saloon was solely reserved for passengers who had paid $45 for high tea. This was a relatively new addition. Though I am a tea toddler myself, $45 is beyond my monthly tea budget and is too much to pay for a lonely meal by myself. Continuing along the promenade, we come to the very aft end of the main deck. Here can be seen the crest of the New Zealand Railways. Moving on to the port side of the main deck, we have a brief look into the engine room. From here, passengers can walk across a catwalk and look down into the engine room. Walking up the main stairway, we enter onto the upper deck. This is by far the most popular area on the ship. Originally, this was an open area, only covered over by a canvas roof. In 1936, a permanent roof was installed to improve passenger comfort. This roof was later replaced during the 1982 refurbishment and permanent windows were installed. Another addition added during the 1982 refurbishment is a viewing area that allows passengers on the upper deck to look down into the engine room. The seats in this area are very similar to what you would find on an old railway carriage and each of them still bear the logo of the New Zealand Railways. Also on the upper deck, you will find the Promenade Cafe. 
which is the only eating option on board. There is a small selection of eating options. The prices are a little bit on the expensive side, but the overall quality of the food is surprisingly good. Walking past the Promenade Cafe, we come to the very aft end of the upper deck. Normally, you would find a pianoist here, playing Edwardian era folk music. But now that has only been reserved for the Saturday night evening cruises. If you are wondering why there is no social distancing, at the time of filming, in August of 2020, lockdown restrictions had been lifted and social distancing was no longer required. Walking back towards the forward end of the upper deck, we come onto the forecastle, which is a word I'm never going to pronounce correctly, no matter how many times I try, and no matter how many times people complain in the comments. Though, if you ever wanted to find a place to do a cringy James Cameron movie reenactment, then this ought to be the place to do it. Originally, the forecastle had a small sheltered area for passengers, but this was later removed during the early 1960s. These two portholes beneath the bridge were originally three square-shaped windows, but these windows were frequently damaged by cargo and were subsequently removed. Heading back inside, we head up the narrow stairway and up onto the starboard side of the bridge wing. From here, we are given a commanding view over the ship. Similar to the main deck, the bridge was originally entirely open to the elements, before a new bridge was constructed during the 1982 refurbishment, making the bridge far more comfortable for members of the crew. The Ernstler is still operated via an engine telegram system to this very day, though the Ernstler is said to have poor handling at slower speeds. Standing up here, placing your hand down and looking over the forecastle can make you wonder what it was like to be on the Titanic during that fateful night. Did Murdoch really see the iceberg first? These are questions you can't help but ask when you are standing up here. So after about 40 minutes, you will arrive at Walter Peak Station. So what is there to do here, you may ask? Well, not that much, to say the least. There was only a handful of farmyard animals to view. As someone who once lived on a farm, this is nothing new to me. Though the staff were handing out kibble if you wish to feed the animals. Other than the animals, there really wasn't that much to see. The nice looking restaurant was closed, presumably due to the crash in the tourism market. The historical farmhouse was off limits, and naturally the only thing that was actually open to view was the gift shop. I wonder why. Though the range and number of appropriately branded gifts on offer were far more substantial than the gifts found in the Queenstown booking office. Overall, would I recommend paying to visit Walter Peak Station in the future? Well, unless things improved, I would have to say no. For me, this is a typical case of the journey being worth more than the destination. The Ernstler is an absolutely beautiful vessel, and the low quality smartphone footage doesn't really capture the true beauty of this vessel. I remember being in the ticketing office overlooking the souvenirs, when I overheard a little kid who was playing on the far side of the room. He was chatting to his parents, comparing the Ernstler to the Titanic. This very much reminded me of my younger self. No doubt this kid is a future Titanic enthusiast in the making. 
But this is not the first time I've overheard people comparing the Ernstla to the Titanic. As a little kid, who was once obsessed with the James Cameron movie, I would have agreed with him, saying, yes, this is just like the Titanic. But as an adult, I would now say no. Yes, the Ernstla and the Titanic were completed the same year, share a similar method of propulsion, the two vessels share a few similar design features, even the funnels used to be the same colour, and arguably the Ernstla is the closest thing to the Titanic in New Zealand. But in my opinion, the Ernstla pales in comparison to the Titanic, and is in no way an even comparison. But this does not mean the Ernstla has no value. It is rare to see a vessel of the same size and age in such prime condition. Also, the Ernstla provides a rare insight into the Edwardian period, which I personally believe to be the golden age of ocean liners. It does make you wonder what it would have been like to tour the Olympic or the Mauritania while they were still around. So, if you ever get the chance to visit Queenstown, good luck trying to do that at the moment, I would highly recommend you take a cruise aboard the Ernstla. If you would like to see more travel related videos, then please like this video to show your support. I've been the Generic Guy Productions, and thank you for watching.